ci sarà Will there be a new day for the world after this pandemic? Will our way of living and working change? What will change? Our personal lives, will our personal lives change? These are the questions that we would like to try and find an answer to during this session. I would like to welcome you all um, from your homes and from the 120 squares from all over the world. We're going to talk about this with Enrico Letta. He is the president of the Jacques Delors Institute in Paris, former Italian prime minister. We're going to address these questions with five journalists connected with us from all over the world. They are famous journalists in their countries for their acute observations and for the sensibility that they've always shown in uh, addressing political issues. We have Daisy Anvar joining us from Jakarta with a video message and Alexander Arkhangelsky from Moscow in a video um, session and David Brooks, a columnist for the New York Times, Christine Ockhan from Paris and Ceferino Reato from Buenos Aires. Let us first start with uh, Desi Anbar from Jakarta. She will share with us the way with which she um, experienced this month and she's going to talk about the prospects emerging from the pandemic. Will be uh, what so-called the new normal will be our normal. And I think it's also, um, I mean, if we look at, I mean, there's plenty of negative aspects about this. Uh, COVID-19 to be sure, but I think it's also an opportunity for us to grow uh, individually, also as a community, also as nations and as global citizens and members of this planet. I think uh, it would be a pity, I would say, if we go back to our old ways, because it's, in my opinion, our old ways is the reason why we are here. And even in Jakarta, Jakarta, we've had very, very bad pollution uh, in the last few years because of you know, more cars on the road, more industrialization, and because of our march towards um, progress and development. And it's very, very um, rare to see blue sky in Jakarta. Now, throughout the few months when most people were staying at home and there was less economic activities, less cars on the road, we've had the most amazing skies in Jakarta. And everybody was like saying, wow, you know, look at the beautiful skies, look at the clouds, we've never seen anything like it. Which means that there was something not right in the way we go about our business. Now, I also think on the, uh, first of all, on the individual side, I really think that this for us individually, every single one of us use this time to reflect and to really, really ask ourselves about, you know, the basic, the fundamental questions of, of life, how do I live my life? Now, we always complain, Michaeli, about, you know, oh, too much work, we don't have enough time for ourselves, we don't have enough time with our children, we don't have enough time with our families, we don't have enough time to do all the things that we love, we don't have enough time to rest and take care of ourselves. Well, we were given this opportunity. And I think, you know, for most of us, whether we wanted it or not, we were forced to really look at what is it that I can do? And we see a lot of people, you know, they start cooking at home, they pick up new hobbies. And of course, because health is the issue and personal responsibility is the only way in which we can combat this disease, i.e. we have to start taking care of ourselves, eating well, exercising, getting enough fresh air, and also taking care of our mental health. You know, otherwise, um, we'd all be you know, down and depressed because we're away from our loved ones. So this is a good time, and I think, to do self-transformation. Now, as a society, this is also a good time for us in which how we should relate to one another. For example, the COVID-19, it's a virus. It doesn't care about who it 
you know, attaches itself to, but the impact is different from uh, for different people with economic and with social backgrounds. And this is the time for us to really start being grateful about if, for example, we can do work from home. It means that we have a home and we, it means we have a job that allows us and it's a good job that allows us to work at home. But what about those people who can't do social distancing because their work takes them outside of the house or because their home condition is not good enough for them to be able to self-isolate. So this is a good time for us to start taking care of our neighbors. We start taking care of the people who are in need. So there was a lot of you know, charity, uh, the social civil society, they start fundraising, they start giving food packages and helping. So this, this sense of we're in it together and yet being aware that some of us are worse off and this is all our responsibility. And the other thing is as a country, I think because you know the, this pollution and um, what we're doing is um, one of the things that we see in this COVID-19 is who are the people we turn to when it comes to dealing with a health crisis like this? It's not the bank managers, it's not the, you know, these fancy high uh, level jobs with high salaries. No, it's the doctors, the nurses, the healthcare workers, the teachers, you know, that parents suddenly realize that how much they depend um, for, on the qualities of the teachers for their education, the delivery people, the people who work in, you know, who, to provide food, because a lot of people now they, they can't go to, you know, restaurants, they can't go to shopping. So there's a lot of these food deliverers. And so these are the people that we actually depend on. And yet these are the people that actually suffer more. So I think when it comes to implementing policies in the future, the government should focus on these social issues more as opposed to just getting, you know, economic growth up, more industries, more manufacturing, and not focusing on things like healthcare or social welfare or alleviating poverty, but really, really take care of the fundamentals of building a good society for everybody. So the blue sky, a new social responsibility, both uh, collective and individual responsibility, a shared responsibility, and existential questions uh, to be um, asked uh, more deeply. These are some of the things that have emerged more deeply. Now let's go to Moscow and listen to Alexander uh, Arkhangelsky. Uh, thank you very much for his um uh, availability. A question also to you, what has changed and what will change in society uh, in uh, terms of the uh, meaning and sense that people have compared uh, to the world they live in? Спасибо за эту возможность высказаться, поскольку времени мало, а проблемы, которые мы обсуждаем глобальны, я попробую поступить с холостически. Я выдвину три тезиса, три контртезиса, а потом попробую предложить синтез. Итак, три негативных тезиса. Пандемия показала слабость двух важнейших институтов, которые отвечают в нашем мире за ценности и смыслы. Это церковь и культура. Они конфликтуют. Они предлагают разные ответы, но эти два института... So religion and culture, they uh, have provided answers, but they've always been very important for their values. We have seen that during the pandemic, we had to sacrifice our possibility to go to mass, to go to church, as well as the possibility to attend uh, performances, for example, in theatres or cinemas, we have seen that uh, we can live without these. Uh, many people have thought that these two institutions are just but a, a decoration that they uh, were wrong before and that they are not that vital as uh, we thought. 
so as to enable us to preserve their role forever. And this is one crisis. Second, what uh, makes me skeptical? And then I will, uh, I will tell you why I am not skeptical. But I will start by saying what could make me skeptical. Authoritarian and totalitarian regimes have performed better than democratic systems with the pandemic. So clearly, China has um, solved the issue of limiting the pandemic much better than the United States of America. Even if China is a huge country, uh, certainly it is not a very democratic one. So authoritarian regimes uh, have been more effective, not so much in terms of managing processes, but rather from the point of view of uh, training because they can block, from the point of view of information, sorry, because they can block negative information, they can redistribute information flows, and therefore they can, in a way, uh, eliminate doubts from people. Uh, conversely, we need open information, but we all know that it's much easier for people not to have uh, open and transparent information. Then there's a third aspect. It concerns the fact that in a postmodern world, the boundaries between the various countries have become more and more blurred. And suddenly, these, these borders have become very strong. So we have come back to a world with frontiers. Uh, so frontiers and borders between individual countries, uh, also neighboring countries. Uh, so countries which, when faced with the first uh, threat, immediately uh, um, erected these frontiers again, although we know that actually bringing down uh, borders was one of the first, uh, the most important achievements that we had in recent years, for example, as uh, was the case with the European Union. We may even provide uh, other examples, but now let me focus on the three positive aspects. Uh, the same pandemic showed that uh, individuals' solidarity is in a number of cases stronger and more effective than the action of any uh, well-governed country. So there is some kind of a trade-off. So where the country is kind of softer, well, then uh, the society has started uh, bringing forces together, uh, sharing ideas and ideals. And for example, in Italy, we uh, couldn't have coped with these huge problems, Italy has been one of the countries that suffered the most and one of the countries that um, managed to get out of these problems better than the other. So Italy has shown the world that our society could uh, create some kind of an alliance with doctors uh, that, that could be help distributed between various classes and institutions. So society has proven to be stronger than the state. Then there's a second uh, optimist argument. Internet and social media services that were not deeply religious have become more and more important. Uh, they've become more important than virtual ones. So we have seen that people who could not uh, establish uh, physical relations still could provide services, for example, through the internet, through the virtual networks. So the church in this respect has been very important. A number of cultural activities have been provided through the internet and concerts have been um, broadcast through the internet. This way they were able to be present in remote. So the uh, more severe the political burdens, uh, uh, the easier and stronger it was to establish links that could go beyond 
any border, any frontier that could overcome differences and divisions uh, uh, that could reach uh, people who were kilometers away. So we can be united. You, we can express solidarity one with the others. And in this respect, the church and culture have been very performing. And then there's a third argument. Humanitarian values have become very important and topical, not only for intellectuals. We know that intellectuals have uh, some time, uh, uh, in a way, as up the right of uh, having rights. But this is because we have stopped trusting people whose profession was, in a way, far away from the humanitarian, humanistic way. So we had started uh, uh, losing trust in people who were outside of the world of production. Uh, with the pandemic, these barriers, these uh, divisions between classes have been overcome. So if we look at what happens today, for example, in White Russia, we know we know that uh, protests not only have a political character, but rather a humanitarian character. Because they see the participation not only of university, of academics or intellectuals, but they also see the participation of uh, um, ordinary citizens. So this means that humanitarian problems and problems linked to values are uh, uh, shared, increasingly shared. So three uh, negative uh, thesis arguments, uh, for example, the frailty shown by uh, culture and uh, the church and religion, then democracy, which has shown uh, to be weak, especially in totalitarian and uh, authoritarian regimes, and then borders, which have been uh, erected again. And then three counter arguments, solidarity, a uh, bottom-up solidarity, which has started, then this virtual unity linked to humanistic values, and then uh, the bigger the frontiers, uh, the stricter the frontiers between countries, the uh, larger solidarity between the people, and there have been humanitarian values spread. And this is something that we uh, uh, can see shown also in the case of Alexei Navalny. We have witnessed the solidarity among those uh, who support him and also among those who considered him as an opponent. That is because uh, uh, humanity is much more important than political values. So, Mr. Letta, a kind of awakening. This is a kind of awakening of civil society also in totalitarian or authoritarian um, uh, countries. Uh, and this is it's interesting to note that all of this has come up in the uh, east of our Country. Actually, these uh, opinions from Jakarta and from uh, Moscow have been very, very interesting. There are three buzzwords that we uh, should focus on and that I would like to pose to the attention of all the people who are following us, uh, whom I would like to greet uh, and also thanks for the great uh, commitment that you have shown with the meeting. They are collaboration society and then borders. These are three very important buzzwords. Collaboration, we've heard that from Jakarta, the CNN reporter from Indonesia has told us what it means to have collaboration between people inside cities and between generations. Let us always remember that these events that the pandemic has clearly shown that we can have collaboration between generations of the youngest generations who made sacrifices to protect the elderly. And then collaboration at a global level, at an international level. There's a sentence I would like to uh, comment. Actually, everybody depends on everyone else. Nobody can say that they uh, actually neglect the others. And then society. Uh, that they don't care about the others. Uh, society become, becomes fundamental. If you look back at the basics of, uh, 
of life. If your society is not strong, I mean, you may have any position you want, but if your society is not strong, if it is not aware, if it is not based on important values, well, then you end up in nothing. That is why it's important to have this clear message from the meeting, because if you have a strong society, then your country becomes stronger. And a strong society has been made even stronger um, due to the pandemic. So reinforcing society is uh, paramount. And then, last word, the borders. Closing borders. Of course, we are locked in within borders, but uh, the pandemic can cross borders and the same applies to pollution. The same applies to uh, major international flows uh, who are capable, which are capable of uh, uh, trespassing borders. The fact is that everybody depends on everybody else. So this issue requires a global collaboration and a global mindset. So that is why I uh, think that the very fact that you entitled this session a new day for the world um, actually made what was said from our from the CNN correspondent in Jakarta actually um, was very topical um, anyone from Paris or Rome or Pisa could have said that same those same things because ultimately we are all individuals we are all human beings we all live on planet earth and having found this interpretation is particularly important. Thank you very much for this interpretation. Now let, uh, let's go to Buenos Aires and let's now listen to Ceferino Reato. Let's ask him what has changed in uh, the last few months and what kind of prospects uh, we can derive from them. Thank you for being with us. First of all, thank you very much, Bernard, and thanks, uh, Enrico, for your kind in invitation. So this question, a new day for the world, is really uh, topical and to the point. Uh, here at the end of the world, as Pope Francis said when uh, he was elected Pope, well, here at the end of the world, we are wondering whether we will witness a new day for the world. And this is a question that we've been posing ourselves since last March, when we first uh, actually saw the pictures coming from uh, uh, Italy, France, uh, Spain, the United Kingdom, images uh, uh, testifying to lots of suffering and pain. So basically from the continent where our ancestors would come. And since then, we've been wondering whether this will be useful for us to have a new day for the world. Unfortunately, I don't have a precise answer to your question. However, the question is, uh, induces me to think a lot. I, I think that an, at an individual level, this is a, uh, an extraordinary moment for us. And it induces us to think uh, now more than ever about who we are, uh, who we would like to be, what our values are, what relations matter the most for us. And also, whether we are living in the exact way we would like to live. So, and when we are, um, in a way, dealing with all these questions, uh, the questions uh, that have been raised by the pandemic, of course, we suffer a lot. But this, at the same time, induces us to think that anyone is important. And I am referring to the very important texts by Julian Caron. The pandemic is um, an unthinkable, unforeseeable, extraordinary uh, event that induces us to think. And this reflection enriches us we can take advantage of this because we can realize that we are indeed important. So we fully 
realize of what we are, what we are as human beings. And it was that basic empathy towards the other is triggered again. And this is very much intrinsic uh, and innate in any human being. So I can say I am uh, happy, but at the same time, uh, a fundamental doubt is raised. What are the others doing? How uh, are uh, those who have become jobless due to the pandemic experiencing this moment? How is this moment experienced by those who are seeing their businesses uh, uh, go bankrupt? Will these people have the same chance that I have to think exactly in this way, in this reassuring way, in a way that helps me, in a way, find my values again? Let me go back to your question which is a very important starting point. Are we going towards a new world? At the beginning, we saw leaders from all over the world who were quite optimistic. They said, OK, we're going towards a better world. Globalization had not dealt uh, so much about human aspects or the environment. Globalization was uh, uh, based and continues to be based on inequalities. It benefits some people and brings disadvantage to other people. Maybe it favors the financial world more and the production world less. In any case, this is a world that, in my opinion, should be improved. At the beginning, leaders were quite optimistic and probably also some of us. But it seems to me that uh, this optimism is now fading away. We look at Europe with, uh, sometimes with envy, with a great admiration. In Europe, you managed uh, to find an agreement on extraordinary uh, financial report. 750 billion euros must have them in forms of grants, and especially for the countries who suffer the most. But we're talking about Europe. In America, every country is trying to actually to save itself as best as it can. And even if governments say that they want to help, actually there's very little to be shared and distributed. So this new world that will uh, uh, affect us all, is this world, uh, I mean, it is a world where we see that we lack global leaders and global institutions. Uh, Europe. Uh, uh, made a huge effort with its institutions, and it indeed has leaders. One of them is the German Chancellor Angela Merkel. These are leaders who have shown to be up to the challenge. Uh, the challenge was not expected. It was unforeseeable, but they managed to reflect, to ponder, and then based on their reflections, they managed to find an area, room, a room of solidarity in Europe. This is how, at least how we see the situation from Latin America. On the other hand, given the global uh, lack of institutions and leadership, I am very much concerned by the increasing levels of poverty, by the lack of income. This might lead to the uh, setting up of movements uh, that were existing before the pandemic. Uh, this is yet another uh, fantastic thing of the pandemic. It is really amazing because it really discloses many of the vulnerabilities that we had before. Very tangibly, one of the fears I have is that the, um, is linked to the loss of jobs, uh, to the loss of uh, companies and, and wealth, and that all this can then lead to excessive nationalism, to radicalism, to radicalized movements, uh, and that these might be even more successful in the future. So we should try and, uh, uh, in a way, reach a number of objectives. Uh, we should take advantage of the time. We have to think about the values that define us as human beings and do our best to make sure that these uh, obscure forces uh, that threaten to bring us back, uh, to have us step back, uh, are successful. We always have to be confident. Uh, we hope that the changes we can uh, implement uh, at an individual level can be distributed among uh, social structures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
Ceferino Reato for this very important contribution because you highlighted the fact that on the one hand there is an awakening of the dignity of the self-consciousness of each person and on the other hand social conditions they make it hard to express it and so there's a big need of solidarity and uh, otherwise we risk to have a new form of totalitarianism. Before delving more into these topics, I ask David Brooks to share his point of view with us and the situation in the US. We are really curious to know your take about this. Um, I've been helped over the past five months by a book that the great Harvard political scientist Samuel Huntington wrote in 1981 called The Politics of Disharmony. In it, he says that history moves forward through a series of moral convulsions. And in the US, these happen every 60, 60 years or so. In 1770, we had the revolutionary moment. In the 1830s, we had a populist uprising. In the 1890s, we had a progressive movement. In the 1960s, we had the counterculture, the new left, the civil rights movement. And in 1981, he predicted that in about 2020, America would probably have another moral convulsion. And of course he was right. And of course it's not just America, it's the entire world is having a moral convulsion. And in more, uh, moments of moral convulsion, there's great indignation at the status quo. There's a contempt for established power. There's a loss of faith in institutions and particularly in government. A new highly moral generation ri ri rises up to the scene and wants to take control. You have new communications technologies that le allow people who are partly outside the system to get into the system. And in these moral convulsions, things change dramatically. It's not just that ideas change or politics change, but the whole frame of reference, the whole consciousness of society is transformed. And I think we're in the middle of that. And we're in the middle of a culture that really was dominated by the baby boomers. A culture of individualism is being replaced by a culture of lack of safety and a response to lack of safety. And so the, the story I would tell would begin in 1968. And this is true in Europe and in the United States and many places around the world. There was a general sense that the culture was too confining, that it was too static and that it was too oppressive. And the baby boomer generation rose up in a spirit of emancipation, of liberation, of individualism. And that individualism had a right-wing version, which was Margaret Thatcher economic liberalism. And it had a left-wing version, which was the lifestyle uh, individualism, the free to live any lifestyle you wanted. And that culture, that moral culture, moral ecology started in the 60s, but it really peaked in the 1990s. And I was living in Brussels then and covering the end of the Soviet Union and the reunification of Germany and the end of apartheid. And it was a great moment of what seemed to be the triumph of liberalism. Democratic capitalism seemed to have triumphed. There was a great theme of convergence, the Maastricht Treaty, Germany coming together, Europe coming together, East and West coming together. We thought China was becoming more democratic. And in retrospect, that great moment of end of history, 1989, 1991, 1993, was in some sense a triumph of something, but also a moment of naive globalization. We were naive to think that prosperity would be evenly shared in a global economy. We were naive to think that people would welcome the intermingling of lots of different races of people in their country without protest. We were naive about a culture of individualism without a sense of moral cohesion. We were naive in Europe to think that there was one single European conversation. And finally, over the decades, over 20 years, people had had enough. And to me, we entered this moment of moral convulsion, which is a global moment. And I would say the opening salvo was in Spain when the indignados and they protested against their own government and their, their mantra was, you do not represent us. And that turned out to be the cry of the 2010s. And we had entered another moment of global of moral convulsion. And what happens in a moment of moral convulsion is a loss of faith, more specifically, a loss of trust, a loss of trust in institutions. In around the world, in almost every country around the world, people trust their government less now than they did before. In the United States, we have the unique disadvantage that we not only trust our government less, 
Only 19% of Americans trust government to do the right thing. We trust each other less. A generation ago, 60% of Americans think that they could trust uh, each other, their neighbors. Now only 33%. And there are three groups who are most distrusting in America. And they're most distrusting because they've been more, the most poorly treated. Trust is a reflection of experience. Trust flows from untrustworthiness. When people are untrustworthy to you, you become untrusting. And that has happened in American society and maybe in other societies. And in our society, three groups have high distrust and all of them for good reason. Black Americans have very low trust in neighbors. And that's because blacks have been treated poorly by their neighbors throughout the course of American history. The white working class has very low trust because they've lost out in the deindustrialized economy and they are the backbone of the support for Donald Trump, who is himself a product of distrust and a sower and creator of distrust. And then young people, if you're a baby boomer, you still have very high trust in your neighbors. But as you go down the income, down the age ladder, levels of distrust rise. And so among millennials and Generation Z, among people under 30, only 19% trust their neighbors. If you ask young adults, are most people selfish and out for themselves? 70% say yes. And that is a reflection of their experience of living in this age of disappointment. And so we around the world have high distrust in government and in the United States, high distrust in each other. And once you get in a cycle of distrust, it tends to magnify itself. And so in the United States, like elsewhere, we had failures of government. We had, I would say, extraordinary failures of government. Almost every institution of society failed us in March when COVID hit. And I should say COVID was not the beginning of this crisis. The earthquake had already happened. COVID was just a hurricane that hit in the middle of the earthquake. And so it didn't start any new trends. It just accelerated all the trends of convulsion that were already underway. And we learned that our government couldn't function that our president couldn't function. But unlike some other societies, and other societies, as was said, the society was greater than the state. Our society was not greater than the state. Our society failed as much. We never shut down as other countries. After our humiliation, we did not rally the way Italy did. And we are now in the midst of still high death, high infection. And then June hit. June of 2020 for the United States and maybe elsewhere was a climactic moment where everything shifts. We went through five big crises at once. Once we had the pandemic. Two, we had massive unemployment economic recession. Third, we had the killing of George Floyd and, an, and a racial reckoning like we'd never seen before. Fourth, we had a political realignment as political views shifted all the way over to the Democratic Party. And fifth, we had a rising generation. Five epic things happening on all at once, each one alone would have been historic, but they all happened all at once. And that's moral convulsions. Things happen all at once. It takes this kind of shock and trauma to the system to shake a culture. And so to me, I think we can already see cultural shift and basically a rejection of the culture of the baby boomer generation, a rejection of individualism, a rejection of convergence, a rejection of that sense of naive globalization and a shift in people's values, a shift from openness to safety, make me safe, make me economically safe, make my health safe, make my political system safe. So we move from high tolerance for risk to a deep desire to, for security. Second, we move from a high emphasis on personal achievement, a meritocracy where some people rise far above others to a tremendous emphasis on equality there's a great intolerance of any kind of inequality right now, whether it's income inequality, status income equality, hierarchies and organizations, people want to be equal. Third, from self to society, the boomers thought themselves emancipated. I am alone. Now people see themselves as members of a group. Either I'm an American, I'm white, I'm Asian. There's members of some, I'm part of an economic class. It used to be, don't label me. Now it's label me. I speak to you as a. Finally, from global to local, we had a period of globalization when it seemed we were gonna be networked individuals in a global system. 
Government and power follows trust, and these days trust is local. And therefore local authorities and local power have much more trust and therefore much more emphasis. The days of liberalism when we had open debates are in danger because people want conformity, they want intellectual safety, they don't want to hear as many foreign views. And so to me, this is a, going to be a shift in politics probably in the US, but more importantly, and I think globally, it's a shift in culture, a shift from the individualism and convergence of the baby boomers to a high awareness of risk and a desire for order and safety, which many people and especially young people feel is missing. So thanks very much for your attention. Grazie, David Brooks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> a vision that is quite complex and of the individualism, lack of trust among the people in institutions, and uh, looking for safety and uh, say trend towards exclusion, not inclusion. So the U.S. are changing uh, radically in a few years' time. Well, I think that these two interventions by David and Seferino is extremely rich. And I want to sort of take two words, uh, inequalities and trust. And I add these words to the three previous ones that I mentioned. And I think that these words are extremely important for us to reflect up, upon what we are talking about. So inequalities. Fortunately, today, we are much more sensitive to the uh, inequalities that we see, because in the past, maybe they were there, but were tolerated. Today, we do not tolerate them any longer. And this is a great opportunity, a positive opportunity, because even if the pandemic is a tragedy with tragic repercussions that had and is still having, but most of all, pushes systems to fight against uh, uh, inequalities, to combat them, to detect them and overcome them. And I think that this is one of the most important challenges that are emerging. Both somehow talked about them, well, starting from very different experiences. And uh, the US experience and uh, Latin America experience in Argentina, namely. But I think that that highlights uh, the need to commit in the post-COVID period, fighting even more against inequalities. Uh, Bernard, you see, in Italy we had uh, Toto, a famous comedian, and a famous film in which he talked about uh, something very special. So the so-called uh, sort of the, le the level that sort of levels things out. So as if it was uh, something leveling things out, but it's not the case. It was just initial impression because actually the pandemic didn't level anything because some people lose their jobs, some companies shut down, some jobs disappear, and there are more difficulties for some people because of the greater digital digitalization, generations that are not digital, and then trust. And uh, David Brooks uh, mentioned this word trust many, many times, and trust, the, the lack of trust, the mistrust, and uh, democracy is having a hard time anywhere in the world. And these problems encountered by democracies in the world is a key topic. We need to somehow renew democracy in order to reinforce it, because our life is so strongly accelerated by digital technologies and even economic activities, only politics and representative democracy are remaining the same. Allow me a slogan. Our lives are 5.0, industry is 4.0, democracy is 1.0. So democracy and representative democracy 
he's lagging behind, is not keeping the pace of all the rest. So we are going through hard times uh, when it comes to uh, representative democracy. We need to giving it new fresh blood. We need creativity. We need to understand how to make citizens more, I mean, uh, part of democracy. We need uh, uh, participating democracy to make uh, people participate more in democracy trying to keep the interest and participation of citizens alive between one election and the other. Otherwise, mistrust will rise. I think this is one of the greatest challenges resulting from the pandemic, because at the end of the day, the answer needs to come from a new alliance between people and institutions. And last but not least, the crisis highlighted the limits of the world order because international organizations showed their limits. The UN, the G7 that disappeared, the G20 disappeared, vanished. There is no global organization. Yes, the UN. Uh, sorry, the European Union, and Seferino highlighted that, that the European Union somehow gave a strong signal, but all the other global ones are in big difficulties in spite of the global nature of the problems we are experiencing. So we need to relaunch, to reflect and react. We are in Italy, and allow me to say that next year, Italy, our country, will lead and guide the G20 we have the presidency of the G20. The G20 has been one of the most important reactions to the previous crisis. And uh, so the G20 was established to react to the 2008 crisis. It played a key role in order to bring uh, uh, non-Western uh, large and uh, middle powers into this group. Next year, Italy will be the president country of the G20, and let's hope that Italy will be able to relaunch it within this context of a need of a new global context and cooperation. Now, let's listen to the contribution by Christine Ockrent that talks about the future of Europe. I think the pandemic showed us the worst face of Europe. That was at the beginning, February, March, where each country only cared about itself and turned inwards uh, and let Italy down, which, uh, frankly, and I live in France, uh, was very shocking, and especially uh, from the French. But then I think we all came to realize that there is no such uh, national solution to any of these problems. I mean, the virus knows no borders. And so you had all that sort of nationalist. And uh, I think that uh, somehow COVID is a historical chance for the European Union to come to grip with its own fate and, and with, with our generation and, and the young generation's duty to engage more. And indeed the agreement, which um, eventually <laughs> happened in Brussels after three or four days of very difficult bargaining, but uh, last month in July, uh, I think it is indeed a, a turning point because um, I think all over Europe, including uh, in those uh, northern countries which pretend to be so much more virtuous than us in the south, uh, I think everybody has understood that there is no national solution. Nationalism is a phony answer. I think uh, we have to try and pursue uh, common projects, common def European defence projects. We, of course, uh, have to play uh, the NATO alliance uh, as best as it can adjust to the current uh, challenges. But I think, again, I think that paradoxically this uh, COVID-19, however atrocious it has been on our societies, 
is indeed a lesson for us all uh, because it shows that Europe exists, that we Europeans have our own fate in our own hands and we are much more united uh, than before. I believe so. I think the next few months are going to be extremely difficult. Uh, I think our social fabric uh, in each of our country will be put to great uh, pressure. Uh, there's money, uh, there's European money. Uh, each of our governments uh, has made plans. Uh, for to try and face the economic and, and social consequences of the crisis, but it is going indeed to be a test and it's going to be a test on our democratic systems. And again, I think we should be very careful about uh, not being infatuated or being intoxicated with all these fake news, uh, propaganda, uh, machines which are extremely powerful. Uh, we are surrounded by uh, regimes uh, which actually look at us uh, as open and indeed we are. I mean and we are proud of being so but uh, we, we should be able to protect ourselves and protecting our very values uh, of social solidarity, that is indeed going to be a huge challenge. But it is only if we manage to maintain, uh, to preserve our the, the fabrics of our societies uh, that we can become stronger uh, over next year. Una durissima prova, un a very hard test for our democratic system. Will Europe uh, live up to this challenge? Well, Bernard, I think that this is uh, the big, big question we are all faced with. And I think that this can mark the end of our debate. Christine Ockrent is one of the most popular faces of uh, journalism in France. I think narr she narrated very well the evolution of pandemic and uh, its impact on Europe because the pandemic was uh, like a, a revealing element, almost a life test. So Europe can either die or be born again. And she told it very well. So between the difference between the first months and July. So a big, big change. And personally, well, I'm a, a strong uh, believer in Europe. And I say it very honestly, I would have never, ever bet a cent on such a good outcome of the European negotiations. And I go back to what Seferino said from Buenos Aires. Uh, probably uh, this is the best image and interpretation that comes from outside Europe of how good was Europe in reaching that agreement. In, on the contrary, in spite of my uh, European nature, I mean, uh, uh, no such things would be obtained. Jacques Delors hasn't be, hadn't been talking for six years. He's 95 years old, and in March he said, Jacques Delors, Europe is undertaking a little risk because the virus is feeding the virus of nationalism inside Europe and so it can die and it was right. So what happened? And so I answer your question. Are we, are we okay? Are we safe? Not yet. Not just yet. We're on the right track. Yes certainly answers given so far are much better than those given in the rest of the world. Why? First of all, because uh, the timing was good. Because do you remember what happened during the previous crisis, the 2008 crisis? 
We had uh, Mario Draghi opening the uh, meeting the other day, and in 2012, on July 26, 2012, Mario Draghi delivered a very famous speech with the famous sentence, whatever it takes, he uttered that, sp that speech in London and said, the crisis had started in 2008, and that speech was in 2012, and uh, so he, somehow that was the beginning of the end of the crisis, but four years had passed. Could we imagine the same timing? The crisis in March, four years to have the solutions, 2024, that would have meant the death for all of us somehow. Answers came four months after. So timing was key. European leaders showed to be able to respond quickly. Third key element, they decided to respond not only on the global microfinancial stability, but also on the social aspects and the real economy, something that Europe had never done. Yes, it had reacted on the health expenditure, unemployment, and real economy, something maybe never done this so compellingly before. And the UK has gone out of uh, the European Union, and maybe that had an impact because uh, the UK was already against the social Europe. It would have put vetoes. It was not part of the decision-making process this time, and so probably the outcome was kicker to get to, because of that, and another key element was the solidarity response. Europe decides to have a, a common bond, so to get debts for the future, we do it all together, and money are redistributed according not to a hierarchy of the countries based on the strength, but simply because of the needs. and. In 2008, Germany had been much more skeptical and rigorous. Instead, this time, Germany led to the construction of a different Europe. So, are we finally rescued? No, not at all, because those are 750 billions that are going to be crucial. For instance, the share for Italy would be key to uh, relaunch the Italian economy, provided that the Draghi agenda uh, will be applied. So what Draghi said here, education and young people at the center of the new political agenda should be crucial. All that is going to be fundamental, provided that we won't lose time. Another question that links up to uh, what Arkhangelsky said from Russia. He talks about some the social fabric that is going to be born again without institutions. What about the European so social sort of nature? Because institutions found agreements, and this is good. But certainly, I hope that uh, Next year, the meeting will think about these topics even more. We are going to have the conference on the future of Europe in autumn. It was uh, fixed. It's going to last one year and a half. It's going to end uh, by mid 2022. And uh, we're going to have discussion, debate, conference at such a high level after the failure of the European Constitution project in 2005. And this conference about the future of Europe is going to be a great opportunity to talk about the European society, the participation of citizens, and how citizens will be able to participate. And I think that next year's meeting may play a key role in that respect, because we need to join this debate with the idea that the pandemic gave Europe an opportunity to reaffirm its existence, but Europe has to conquer that. And my personal conclusion is that in a changing world that is getting bigger, US, China, what's the meaning of Europe? Being integrated at the European level means for each European country not to have to decide whether to become a Chinese colony or a US colony but to remain Europeans, and I think that this is the greatest mission of Europe. Thank you very much, Enrico.
certainly next year we're going to talk about Europe and say we in, we we will invite Alexander Karkensky, Chef Ignoriat and David Brooks. Thank you very much. I hope to have you here next year in Rimini. It was not possible this year. So this is an official invitation next year to look at Europe from the world and vice versa. Thank you very much to all of you. And uh, thank you very much. And I wish you a good continuation. Goodbye and thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.